Welcome or welcome back to a new episode of the future of. This is the space for those curious about the future. I'm Andrea Ferrante and every week I tell you about the technologies, strokes of genius and discontinuities that could become big and shape the way we will live tomorrow. In this episode. 1. Coasts at risk. We bring attention back to the effect of rising seas on the communities that now live along the coasts. New evidence and estimates tell us that much more serious programmatic efforts are needed. 2. The return of the blimp. While the world spins and focuses on projects to go faster, a British company is working on an all-electric blimp, which looks like a five-stars flying hotel, and is obviously proceeding at a placid pace. 3. Moon Buggy If you have in mind the human-guided rovers of the Apollo missions of the 1970s, new lunar dune buggies are on their way to support the Artemis mission, promising increased performance. 4. Age Limits While one strand of research tells us of a future in which age can be extended substantially, a new study sets this limit below 150 years. We understand how the resilience of a human body is measured and why it is not infinite. 5. Digital Fingerprints British police arrest a known drug trafficker from a close-up photo of his hand showing a cheese he has a sweet tooth. Recovering fingerprints from an image isn't new, but it's still an underrated frontier for better or worse. Are you ready? Then hold on tight, buckle up, ready to go. Silence, please. Coasts at risk. When a catastrophe happens, humans clearly tend to react. In retrospect, we often try to close the barn door when the oxen have already run away, but a shock usually generates some kind of action. On the other hand, when the changes are slower, routine, almost immersed in our daily lives, the reaction is often null or even continue to keep risky behaviors out of laziness. This is why I decided to dedicate the cover story of this episode, once again, to a theme as important as coastal erosion. The most respected projections of sea level rise and its effects come from extensive, professionally reviewed research projects involving hundreds of experts from academia, government, and the private sector. They include separate reports published by groups such as the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the U.S. Global Change Research Program, as well as nonprofit organizations including the Union of Concerned Scientists and the First Street Foundation. Here is some evidence, somewhat focused on the U.S., among the many we hear about that we can take as pillars and bases of reasoning for future insights in other places around the world as well. First, by 2100, nearly 490 communities nationwide will experience chronic flooding. And this is an intermediate scenario, not the worst case. Second, categories from FEMA, the U.S. General Emergency Management Agency, misclassify millions of properties as being at low risk of flooding. By the agency's own accounts, about 40% of flood insurance claims between 2017 and 2020 were on properties considered low risk, and that's no small problem for occupants, insurers, and the entire real estate world. Third, the rate of sea level rise has generally increased in recent years and is expected to accelerate rapidly in the coming decades. Beyond 2100, sea levels will continue to rise for hundreds more years. But what exactly are we saying when we talk about risk? By how much will the seas rise? The U.S. Global Change Research Program has developed three projections that vary depending on future levels of global carbon emissions, a major factor in the melting of ice that causes sea levels to rise. The worst-case scenario assumes that the increase in carbon emissions continues at recent rates, pre-pandemic rates for short. An average sea level rise around the United States of about 60 centimeters by 2045 and 2 meters by 2100. The intermediate scenario assumes that mitigation efforts lower carbon emission trends by mid-century. Sea level rises average about 30 centimeters by 2035 and 1.2 meters by 2100. The best-case scenario assumes more immediate reductions in carbon emissions, 
similar to those defined in the 2016 Paris Agreement, just under 50 cm by 2100. For homeowners in at-risk areas now, the slow progression of sea rise and the threat of sudden destruction from increasingly violent storms are already more financially dangerous now than the end-of-century forecast itself. Breathtaking ocean views could still attract large investments, even though people know the water could be coming in front of their homes fairly soon. Home buyers actually start to lose interest when regular tides flood housing areas five, six or seven times a year. And that could happen decades before what's known as chronic flooding, defined as tidal inundation, that covers at least 10% of a community's living space 26 times a year or more. But the real problem is certainly not the luxury beachfront homes. It's the mass of people. About 40% of the U.S. population, for example, lives along the continental coast, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And it's barely better here in Italy. We are a country with over 8,000 kilometers of coastline, and about 30% of the population lives in municipalities bathed by the sea. According to ISPRA, from 1950 to 1999, 46% of the low coasts has undergone modifications of more than 25 meters and, even if we have considered those areas that have been taken away from the sea with filling works and, during the years, partially renaturalized, the stretches of coast in erosion, equal to 1.170 kilometers, are higher than those in progress. With the rising of the seas, the situation will certainly worsen, although in the Mediterranean Sea the maximum amplitude of the tides is on average 45 centimeters, unlike the countries in northern Europe where it can exceed 10 meters. So oscillations also for us, but less intense even in case of sea level rise. The basic problem, if anything, is that we are managing the variations produced by global warming with the ordinary approaches that we have learned in the past. Whereas we would probably need a contingency and management plan for inhabited areas at risk, consistent with the likely future. Otherwise, we will always just be managing emergencies. The return of the airship. The view from the fully glazed cabin is breathtaking. The point where the coast and the immensity of the sea touch is a rare view from above, something that from the airplanes you can only peek through the small porthole, but from the comfortable seat of the airship is something else entirely. The feeling of floating through the air at a decidedly non-supersonic speed also makes for a much more relaxed experience. It seems that the context even affects the crew, who are more, laid back, as the English say. All while comfortably reading a book and sipping a juice or cocktail. If you're thinking of this black and white scene, with the image of the Hindenburg or some 1960s film in mind, I invite you to fast forward to 2025, when the British company Hybrid Air Vehicles, HAV, plans to launch a new type of medium-range airship named Airliner. From England to the Balearics or Barcelona could be good routes for example. Routes studied for the 100-passenger Airlander 10 airship include a Barcelona to Palma de Mallorca in four and a half hours. The company said the airship trip would take about the same amount of time as air travel once the trip to and from the airport is taken into account but would generate a much smaller environmental impact have wrote on its web page that the carbon footprint per passenger per kilometer on its airship would be about 9 kilograms, a full 90% less than a classic jet plane. The aircraft itself is fascinating, practically a five-star flying hotel, which has a flight range of five days and a range of 4,000 nautical miles, which adds up to a promise of really low pollution. That could really be kept, especially in the versions planned for 2030 and all four engines in the Airlander will be fully electric. In fact, a consortium between HAV, Collins Aerospace, and the University of Nottingham has won more than £1 million in funding from the UK Aerospace Research and Technology Programme to develop electric propulsion technologies using the Airlander as an initial platform. The project will deliver a full-size prototype 500 kW electric powertrain to HAV for ground testing and future production-ready technologies. 
These technologies will be directly applicable to a future airlander, with the goal of replacing the fuel-powered front engines, as a first step toward an all-electric version of the aircraft. Airlander in fact wants to use a combination of aerospace technologies already proven in the world of airships, such as hull fabrics and the use of helium, in the field of fixed-wing aircraft, such as composite structures, engines and avionics, and also drawing from the world of helicopters, optimizing the vectoring thrust. The hull is a laminated fabric composed of materials designed for strength, helium retention and durability. Filled with helium, the hull is aerodynamic, in fact it has an elliptical cross-section with a longitudinal bell shape. Inside the hull, there are the so-called ballonets, compartments, filled with air, which help to maintain the internal pressure of the hull while the helium expands and contracts. Due to changes in temperature and altitude. Of the engines we said, today they are combustion, but they will be replaced by electric motors. On the composite side there is not much to say, the airlander uses two different types of structures for the rigid elements of the aircraft, carbon fiber and fiberglass, technologies widely used in other aircraft and vehicles. In short, the technology is there, even if on balance it's less futuristic than it sounds. The question is whether there's a market. Independent estimates by the company say it could be worth $50 billion over the next 20 years. A claim I don't have data to go into, but it sounds a bit like an attempt to give a big number, and over a long time to boot. It's all up to this point, to see if customers will prefer to fly fast by traditional means or relax aboard a luxury object that flies slowly. In one case you arrive earlier, in the other you enjoy the journey. I have no doubt that both types of users will exist and I have some doubts that the payoff of reduced fuel consumption and pollution will be enough to make the public fall in love with this aesthetically beautiful beast. Only time will tell us the truth. Moon Buggy They call them Moon Buggies. If the famous dune buggy from the Bud Spencer and Terence Hill movie came to mind, you haven't gone very far, even though we are obviously talking about much more technological products and, in this case, designed for astronauts on the moon or future planets. A few days ago Lockheed Martin and General Motors unveiled their plans to build a rover-like autonomous vehicle that future astronauts will be able to use to get around on the surface of the moon. The two companies have partnered to launch a lunar terrain vehicle concept as part of NASA's Artemis program, a moon exploration campaign that calls for various robots, vehicles, and science bases to be implanted on the surface of our satellite within the next decade. Lockheed and GM said in a joint press release that the vehicle will use the automaker's autonomous driving technology and is designed to traverse significantly greater distances than Apollo-era vehicles. Much like those lunar vehicles of the 1970s, the new concept will be all-electric. The so-called LRV, which stands for Lunar Roving Vehicle, was a rover that was built in four units for NASA and used by astronauts during the last three lunar missions of the Apollo program, just to explore the surface of the moon. It was used for the first time on July 31, 1971 during the Apollo 15 mission, becoming the first all-terrain vehicle to be driven by a human outside the Earth. It was a small, spartan-looking, two-seat all-terrain vehicle with a mass of 210 kilograms and a length of 3 meters, capable of carrying over 490 kilograms of payload at a modest speed of 14 kilometers per hour, thanks to four 0.25 HP electric motors, each powered by non-rechargeable batteries. In return, it boasted an advanced navigation system, and an original wheel design. The wheels, in fact, consisted of a spun aluminum hub and a tire almost 82 centimeters in diameter and 23 centimeters wide made of woven and galvanized steel wires. Titanium tires covered 50% of the contact area to provide traction. Inside the tire was a 65 centimeters diameter frame to protect the hub. Dust guards were mounted above the wheels. In short, in space, every detail is crucial, and even a simple will becomes a super-technological object. 
If you're wondering why the engines were apparently underpowered and the speed low, remember that on the lunar surface gravity is one-sixth of Earth's. If you press the accelerator too much on stony or steep terrain, you risk flying away in the blink of an eye. NASA's new vehicle will still be all-electric, but capable of recharging itself, thanks to onboard solar panels and infrastructure that can be set up on the moon, such as the human landing system. It should be able to carry at least two fully equipped astronauts, including the driver, as well as cargo for a total carrying capacity of over 500 kilograms. On a single charge it will need to be able to move at least a couple of kilometers. The rover will also need to be rugged and able to withstand the surface temperatures of the lunar south pole, which can range between more than 100 degrees in the sun and minus 100 degrees during the lunar night. NASA's manned lunar landers are expected to land on the flatter parts of the lunar surface, away from the large boulders and shadowed craters that are believed, however, to contain the most scientifically interesting specimens, including ice particles. The more versatile NASA's lunar rover is, the more it can help astronauts conduct scientific experiments. Because therein will lie the real novelty of the vehicle. It will have to become a real self-propelled research laboratory, not just a simple means of locomotion. And here's why we talk about autonomous driving. The Lockheed Martin GM rover would be able to preposition itself autonomously near a landing or analysis site before the astronauts arrive, and in case humans aren't even essential, the astronauts could conduct entire scientific operations without the pilot. I just wonder if this jewel of technology will go to join those left on the moon at the end of the mission. Because those used for the Apollo 15, 16, and 17 missions were then abandoned on the planet itself. It's nice to remember that the first one used was even license plate. It was written Moon LRV 001971. Age limits. I have finally reached 150 years of age. All this new technology has led me to live almost twice the life expectancy of just 30 years ago, 2020. Now I wonder if for my children, some innovation will really make them reach 200 years old as some are promising. Here, this sentence, which might not be so strange at first, if we project the scientific progress of the last half century into the future, would instead be literally impossible according to some. Science is once again challenging the idea that we could live to the age of the biblical Methuselah. New research from Singapore-based biotech company Jero examines the human body's ability to recover from illness, accidents, or anything else that puts stress on its systems. This basic resilience diminishes with age, with an 80-year-old needing, on average, three times as much time to recover from such stresses as a 40-year-old. If you have ever known an older person who has had a bad fall, this seems easily understandable. Recovering from a fall can be life-threatening for a particularly frail person, while a similar fall could put a person half their age out of commission for only a short time. For a child or teenager, it might even end with a shrug and a laugh. This concept of resilience was measured just so. The authors focused on two parameters. The first is an instantaneous value, often referred to as biological age, and is exemplified by the dynamic organism state index, known as the DOSI. This quantity is associated with stress, lifestyle and chronic disease, and can be calculated from a standard blood test. The other parameter, precisely resilience, reflects the dynamic properties of fluctuations in organism state, it informs how quickly the DOSI value returns to normal in response to stress. If you extrapolate the decline caused by old age in a serious and scientific way, which is what the study in question did, you will find that the resilience of the human body is completely gone at some age between 120 and 150. In other words, at some point our bodies lose all ability to recover from virtually any potential stressor. Researchers came to this conclusion by examining health data from large groups from the United States, United Kingdom and Russia. They looked at a variety of parameters, from blood cell counts to the number of steps recorded by wearables. As people experience different stressors, the researchers sized up the notion that recovery time lengthens as we age. 
The predicted loss of resilience in even the healthiest individuals who age successfully could explain why we don't see a noticeable increase in maximum lifespan, while average lifespan has steadily increased over the past few decades. The new research brutally validates the idea that humans begin to die from the moment they are born, but the process appears to accelerate significantly between the ages of 35 and 45, when the body's resilience begins to decline more rapidly. The study's conclusion is that the body loses all ability to cope with, or at least recover from, stress before age 150, which is in line with the findings of similar studies, including one from last year that set the maximum possible human age at 138. According to co-author Andre Gudkov, from the Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center in Buffalo, New York, this work explains why even the most effective prevention and treatment of age-related diseases could only improve average, but not maximum lifespan, unless true anti-aging therapies were developed. Yet some doubt remains with me. If we take historical trends about the lives of certain living things and extrapolate or apply them to other species, don't we fall into the error of trying to predict the future with the lens of the past? Since Jero produces a wearable that aims to measure the dosi, the famous dynamic organism state index, I would like to think that this study is simply a nice marketing tool for their device, but clearly they could be right. Very Digital Footprints While searching for good news to tell you in this week's episode, I came across an article that said this, the scenarios described in George Orwell's 1984 could materialize in 2024 if lawmakers don't protect the public from artificial intelligence. A statement even made by Brad Smith, the president of Microsoft. At first I didn't give it much weight, also because the Chinese government's massive control over the population's behavior has already been talked about far too much. Often the topic is not treated for the sake of democracy, but because Americans seem not to keep up with the incredible developments of the Asian dragon's artificial intelligence. Here then is a proliferation of biased evidence. Like that 54% of the world's 770 million CCTV cameras are in China, at least according to research by Comparatech. And that population control really does seem contrary to our Western principles. Forgetting, perhaps, that early last year, before the pandemic monopolized our attention, if we came close to a third world conflict, it was because a star-spangled autonomous military drone fired on and killed an Iranian general. But we're not here to evaluate who makes better use of artificial intelligence-based technologies, we're here to reflect on Brad Smith's quote. And if that sounds a bit like apocalyptic science fiction to you, then I'll cite a rather tasty story that, however, seems to be heading in just that direction. Last week, the British police arrested a well-known and highly sought-after drug trafficker thanks to a photo on a social network. But not of his face, but of his hand showing a famous French cheese he had just purchased. From the photo of the fingers, investigators were able to trace the fingerprints, then obviously the person, then the location and finally the arrest. The social network in question is not one of those that we common mortals use, but an encrypted marketplace of the underworld, which then the police kept an eye on, but the basic concept does not change. Now this story clearly represents to us a virtuous use of technology. Who wouldn't want a dangerous criminal in jail? But on the other hand, it also tells us how seemingly innocuous gestures can become a boomerang. Besides, we are not even aware of what technology can really do. In this case, in fact, it must be said that biometric models are based not only on the shape of the lines of our fingerprint, but also on the depth of the valleys and ridges that make it up. This factor alone greatly complicates obtaining a biometric template from a photo of a fingerprint. Obtaining accurate three-dimensional information in which the slightest variation is appreciated from a two-dimensional image is indeed complicated. But evidently, it can be done. And for England it's not even a pioneering episode, since already two years ago a similar case was solved thanks to a photo found in the phone of an arrested person, where a picture of ecstasy pills was found in the palm of a drug dealer's hand. And the Japanese, it turns out, have done even better. 
It was in 2017 that a study by researchers at the National Institute of Informatics announced that they had successfully extracted usable fingerprints from photos of fingers, taken up to three meters away. This is troublesome news given that biometric authentication is becoming more and more prevalent, with fingerprints being one of the preferred methods of protecting applications and physical assets. Now, I don't know if artificial intelligence and certain technologies can really disrupt our democracies, but I do know that the criminals of the last century, like Arsene Lupin, who pulled off their heists in white gloves, were onto something. Thanks for listening to the future of, really. You could have listened to the radio, you could have spun a vinyl, you could have put on a cassette, you could have used a stereo 8, to know what it was, but instead you preferred the future of. That's what I thank you for, and you still have hundreds of episodes left to discover. Sentence of the Week Devin Feidler, researcher at the Institute for the Future wrote, as basic automation and machine learning move closer to becoming commodities, uniquely human skills will become more valuable.